So we've, um, we're now in the fifth session. Uh, we've gone from cultural background, uh, critical context into what it means to create a data set and the choices that are made there and how um, a really simple model, just looking at the mean and standard deviation can even learn to interpret the data and that could be used for image generation. Um, uh, really simple ones, but yes, that's possible. Um, we, we extended that to sorting and looking at manifolds of images, um, trying to understand uh, in the next week then how a image neural network could do better than just the mean and what kind of features it would use to try and sort and extract um, meaning out of an image data set. Uh, and then we looked at that uh, again in the last week um, in two sessions when we started to use those same features um, to create a image matching process. And we looked at how um, you could calculate the distance between two different features uh, or even one feature and a whole database of features and how that, that could be used for a creative application of um, an image kind of mashup or in the case of two videos, a video mashup. So this week we're going to extend um, our image generation capabilities straight into the state of the art. So no more playing with Python code, no more collab for now at least, we'll probably come back to it. Um, but for this week, we're going to be looking at um, just briefly the kind of major strokes of how we got here to what we're going to look at in the lab, which will be run, uh, Runway ML and um, StyleGAN2. Uh, but there are just kind of like some, you know, markers that I thought would be useful to, to have. I've got the wrong subtitle down here on the bottoms, but that's okay. Um, so Eigen images, uh, is more or less kind of what we were looking at in the first lab session. We were looking at the means and standard deviations. And I'm going to use this term that I've been using, but stop me if you have a question on any terms that I'm, you know, running by. Otherwise, you know, I'll just keep going to ask me these questions. So in the first lab, we had this um, data set and we calculated the mean image and we we basically projected our data set into the single point created by the mean. And uh, I want you to kind of think about that process. Like what does it mean to take all of this data and collapse it down into a single point, the mean? Um, and what we did from there is that we started, we started to project out away from the mean by using the standard deviation. And that gave us a direction that we could follow, right? Uh, we kind of looked at that with the GIF. You know, we created a GIF where we added the standard deviation and subtracted the standard deviation from the mean. And that created this, you know, depending on your data set, um, but for the faces at least, it kind of created an image that went from like a kind of like small face to a larger face, right? Um, that axis is more or less this Eigen axis. And in the 1980s, it was used uh, up until almost the 2000s for um, image generation, yes, but you know, uh, more in industry applications, it was used for image recognition, um, for facial recognition, for expressions, um, for a lot of different things. And that, that was more or less the, the first axis of, um, of variation that was modeled. Uh, but they would model many more axes of variation using a very similar process. Um, and here we're looking at uh, basically the, the kind of means, but four different means of an image data set of faces. Okay. So this is, you know, really complicated slide is just kind of wanted to bring back this mean image thing. And then there's some process that, you know, is able to um, 
to correlate that mean face along with some deviations to it to any novel face here. This is like some flow chart that says there's a new face and then we do something to it. There's a big W here. And then we calculate the, the similarity between the projected face and this modeled version of all of our faces. And you get some distance metric. Not unlike the distance metric that we calculated last week with um, trying to create our video mashup, really, really similar components here. And then, you know, they dictated that, oh, that was a similar face, you know, that looked like my model at that point. It had that much standard deviation, for instance. Um, here, you can kind of see what happens when you uh, have a mean face and you apply different directions to that mean face. Th these are what are called the eigenvectors. Um, and uh, if you've ever taken linear algebra or if you ever end up looking at this stuff in more detail and want to understand the math and um, come across these terms, this is uh, the eigenvectors. Um, you're kind of creating this this direction for which to change the pixels in the mean phase. And each one of these different eigenfaces are different ways of varying the mean phase. So it was, a, it was quite a cool technique, you know, for about 20 years. And uh, it was used for a lot of things, um, pretty unsuccessfully perhaps, you know, like it, we didn't have facial recognition on our phones or anything like that, right? But, um, yeah, it was definitely a lot of work in progress at that time. So what when was that, did I say? Yeah, like sort of up, in, I'm being very generous with, with the end date here, but you know, it was about 20 years or so it had its kind of heyday. Um, I'm not sure if this is a accurate one to put in here because this was more used for modeling the, the shape of a face, but uh, I wanted to include it because there's a fun example of this um, here. And this was almost 10 years ago, where not unlike the eigenfaces, you're trying to model all the possible variations of a face and then trying to project a novel face and measure the correlation between that novel face and um, your model. And this was just exploring that model way back when. Um, so I'm, I'm basically making some facial gestures and then uh, seeing how the model interprets those facial gestures, right? And you can kind of see some some compressed version basically of my face there. Uh, but this model was also used for trying to track the outline of the face as well. So there was kind of another purpose to this model. So that was, um, that was state of the art about 10 years ago. And then I don't know why I included this one, but you know, just for kind of completeness sake, there was also this other um, other model popularized in 2006 when they actually realized how to train these things. Um, also used for uh, modeling images and was quite popular, you know, up until 2013, let's say. About 2010 or so, we start seeing you know, these networks are getting easier to train. Um, the compute power is growing. The uh, technology, the software capabilities for doing um, machine learning in a way that doesn't really require a lot of hand working of math and, and certain things, like it just became a lot, a lot easier. Data sets also started to grow. Um, and there was this kind of like real big shift, let's say in 2012 or so. And um, things just rapidly have been changing ever since. Um, every year, the kind of state of the art grows in orders of magnitudes. And um, this, this type of model is still very much a state of the art, 
Will's hear about GANs and maybe you've, you've come across GANs quite a lot, but um, this is still, you know, a very, very powerful model and can produce, you know, just as um, interesting of images, uh, really. So this was an early exploration of that, which we saw in a previous lecture. Um, we can revisit it real quick. This uh, network stands for the Variational Autoencoder. And um, I won't dig into the details of its architecture. I think it's, it's a bit gnarly to try and understand. Um, but at a high level, what it's trying to do is take as input this set of data, it could be images, right? So you've got an image data set. And it's trying to project that image data set down to a very few set of numbers, just like an image classifier does. Um, it tries to project it down to 2048 images, uh, sorry, 2048 values. And then the very next layer in an image classifier is that it tries to predict the label from those 2048 values. The autoencoder does the same thing, except it doesn't classify at the end. Instead of trying to classify from those 2048, 2048 values, what it tries to do is reconstruct the input, tries to re reverse what it's done. And uh, they call that process an autoencoder. Um, quite a fun idea, I think, of a, of a network. So you've got, you know, this is a really, really toy representation of what this network is, is that you've got as input say every pixel on an image, and you try to project it down to a very few set of values, just like the image classifier does, you know. But then from those very few set of values here, you try to recreate the input. And um, this is all matrix math, effectively. Like I've got a matrix here that's 784 values, and then I multiply it by a 784 by 512 matrix and I end up with 512 values. And then I do the same thing, so on and so on until I get to a really small set of numbers. And then I revert, the, I inverse the matrices, uh, transpose them, and I, I get back larger and larger sets of numbers from my small set of numbers. And it's, it's really just a lot of matrix math. It's, it's crazy how this stuff works at all. But um, yeah, I said I wouldn't go into the details. Yeah, so in this particular model, um, uh, you know how we could project down our images to a set of features here. Um, it could be 2048 features. Um, it could even be two features. So there could be just two features that represent your entire data set, right? So if you had two features and you constrained the two features so that they were say between zero and one, then what this plot represents is the entire space of what your model has learned by saying like, let's say that this is the first, first features axis is zero um, to one, and then the second features axis zero to one. Um, it's not unlike the TSNE plot that we've looked at where we had a set of features already and we projected that down to two values. In this case, we're we're also learning the projection to two values and then seeing how each feature could be recreated back as an image. So going from the two values back to an image and then just seeing what that image looks like. Okay. So enter GANs, right? Um, which I'm sure everyone has come across if you're in this course um, you've been tempted by GANs I've 
tried to hold off on GANs as far as I could. Today is the day. Um, a little history. Uh, we've got the kind of architecture here. This is probably really opaque, but I'll try to break it down and talk about it. And then please ask me questions if things still feel you know, unclear. The general idea between uh, with the generative adversarial network is that you have effectively two networks. You have the generator and the discriminator. And the two networks actually are sort of very easily described by the um, autoencoder that we just looked at. So the autoencoder have uh, on one end a generator and on the other end a discriminator, except they're, they're connected, right? On one side, um, this is, I don't like this image as much. Let's see. Yeah, let's say this one. So uh, on one side, you have the input image being projected down to say two values. It doesn't matter how many values there are. Um, it could be 2048, it could be two, like whatever. But you have some input image space. Um, this might be 512 by 512 by three um, for the three color channels. So you'll have that many input neurons. And you're somehow learning how to represent all of those values to, with two values here in this case. So that is um, the same architecture, literally the same architecture as the discriminator. You've got as input some set of images and you're outputting two possible values. Is it real or is it fake? So the whole role of this discriminator network is to try and guess uh, is what it's been given a real or fake image? And the generator here is actually the learned part of learning how to generate images that look like the training set. So you've got these two networks. They're not connected um, like the autoencoder. They're trained in, uh, in an ad hoc way, whereas the autoencoder have the two networks um, attached and they're trained at the same time. And so it sets up this interesting adversarial process, and hence why they call it the generative adversarial network. And it's, it, it kind of comes from this game theory um, aspect where you have, you have uh, this endless cycle of one competing with the other and what that ends up producing is hopefully a better version of either. You start off with the discriminator and a generator that doesn't know anything. And you've got your training set of images. You feed them into your discriminator. And your discriminator, you know, to start off with has a fake guess. It's like, oh, I think it's fake. And you tell the discriminator like, no, that was actually real, you know, correct your network so that next time you, you realize that that was real. And you do some math and you know it updates its weights and it figures out a better projection. So that next time when it sees that image, it's more likely to have said real. Meanwhile, you also have this other network, the generator, and the generator is learning to fool the discriminator. So it has its own uh, update rule where it says, uh, you know, it starts off randomly. It has some set of values. In this case, let's say it's got 2048 values and it um, randomly generates 2048 values and it uh, takes those 2048 values and it creates an image out of it. And uh, that's the fake image. We then feed that to the discriminator and we say, you know, what do you think? The discriminator says, um, oh, that's fake. And you, you reward the discriminator and you say, yeah, good job. You know, however you updated your weights before, that was good. Keep doing that. 
And then with the generator, you say basically, oh, you did, you didn't fool the discriminator, you know, so you better do better next time, you know, correct your weights in the direction that's more likely to fool the discriminator next time. That's kind of the mechanics in a really kind of nutshell way, layman's way. That is the GAN. And the basic idea of the GAN, um, why every other kind of iteration of this, so this was 2014 and now it's 2020. And I think like in 2015, maybe there were two papers other than this GAN on the topic of GAN. There was LAP GAN and DC GAN. And um, then all of a sudden there were like hundreds per month or something ridiculous, you know. And um, it's been an explosion of GAN networks. But the fundamental idea of having these two components, a generator and a discriminator, that, that has remained more or less constant um, through all the uh, generations of GANs. So this was one of the earliest um, GANs. This was the second GAN or third, um, Alec Radford, uh, Luke Metz, and Sumit Chintala. And this is uh, an extension of that first GAN paper, but they, um, the first GAN paper basically treated each pixel as a neuron, and this used a different type of network, which was a convolutional network. And, um, that was a good idea, basically, a very good idea. Um, so the early generations that they had then, this was like high resolution for 2016. You know, this is the actual size of the image. Um, so that's what we were talking about in 2016. And uh, they were able to do quite cool things, you know, like people before that had an tried latent walks. They hadn't really tried the variety of different types of data, at least that I had seen, as what this paper had explored. And it was a really, really cool paper. Definitely like changed the idea of what was possible with GANs. Um, they also showed this fun thing, which was arithmetic on faces. And We'll try and look at this in a later session. Um, we'll probably not look at this with images, but we will come back to it with um, text. Um, the idea here really came from a, an, a kind of classic example in um, text networks. And the idea was that if you had a representation of uh, one set of an idea, like uh, in this case, the smiling woman, as they call it. Um, and you had a, another set of images and you, you wanted to find how to encode the difference between these two sets of images. What you could do is just subtract their latent representation. So what is the latent representation? That is, this value right here. <clears throat> the values that lead to the generation of an image. So this, let's say that this is 2048 values, or let's say it's 512 values, whatever it ends up being. It depends on the network. Usually one of these two sets of numbers, either 512 or 2048. We call that the latent representation. And the reason that we call that the latent representation is that that is all that is needed in order to generate an image that looks like that. Um, another way to think of that is in an autoencoder. So in this case, we had an, um, sorry, we had an image as input and we're encoding that image with a set of values. And this is called the latent representation because at the same, just like with the generative part of the generative adversarial network, you can take that set of numbers and create a generation of an image that is 
totally based on only those numbers. So this is, um, this is a little important to think about because we're gonna come back to this in runway. So ask me questions if this part isn't clear. If you are still unclear on what is the latent representation of an image, then ask, ask me something, please. So here, each image has a latent representation. Each image can be described by um, that set of numbers that I mentioned. If it's 512 values here, or if it's 2048 values, whatever. But each image, I, I know I can project it through this network and get back a set of numbers that represent what that image um, means to this network. And it'll be a collection of 512 or 2000 values. And um, here we're saying that each image, okay, so I've got um, 2000 values for this first image. I've got another 2000 values for this one, another 2000 values for this one. What I can do is I can just average all of those values and get a sort of like representative version of all of these things in my data set. It's literally calculating the mean of the uh, latent representation. And so this will be another set of 2000 values or whatever the size of that latent representation was. You do the same thing for another set of images. And what happens if you subtract those two values, this set of 2000 values from that set of 2000 values, you get a vector effectively. You get like a direction of values. There's 2000 values still, but those 2000 values now represent geometrically a direction between the first set of values and the second one. If you think of, um, if you think of this as points in space, the smiling woman isn't a point in 2000 dimensional space over here. And then you've got the neutral woman in a, another point of 2000 dimensional space over here. If you subtract the two, you're creating a direction in space. And that direction can be added to any point in space. So I can take another point in space, which is my neutral man collection, and then add that same direction to the neutral man. And what happens is that it ends up looking like the difference between these two images, which is the smiling factor. And you get back smiling, um, but on the neutral man is the idea. There's another example here with glasses that you have a collection of people with glasses, another one without glasses, and then you apply it to another set of images and now they have glasses. There's a model in Runway called GLOW, G-L-O-W, and it more or less does this, but like, you know, four years later now with much more advanced networks and data and all that. Um, so that's, that's kind of what's happening under the hood with that model. And we'll look at that in a bit. Runway has a, um, a fun way of exploring the latent representation space. So they, they basically allow you to have a bunch of random numbers generated and look at the generated images. Then you can pick which ones you like and create like um, a linear kind of generation of images from one to the next and you can like build up um, latent generations of different key points effectively in your latent space. Latent representations, latent space, these terms starting to make some sense. So here is a, you know, that same early model 2016, uh, Alec Radford um, generating a bunch of faces basically from that, the latent representations of 
their data set, um, which is on faces. Uh, he also explored album covers. And this was the first time I saw anything like this. And I was blown away by this. I remember just staring at this and like, what happened? How did that happen? And um, this was really cool when it came out, 2016. Um, yeah, there's there's a couple more examples on on that website, on the GitHub, and in the paper. Um, but this was high res for the time, and I think this was like 128 by 128. I'm jumping a lot, but you know the kind of next kind of seminal change um, that felt like a really big you know, stride was in 2017, was Pix to Pix, as it's known. Um, the paper title was Image to Image Translation with Conditional Adversarial Nets. And the idea with this network is that you have paired images. You've got, um, for instance, uh, an image of labels of a street scene, and you want to generate what they look like. Or you've got a textured satellite map, and you've got the kind of city view or whatever. Um, again, like labels and the generations, or you've got day to night, um, black and white to color, etc. So this was quite cool because the the constraints that they had on this network meant that they could start generating quite high resolution stuff for for 2017, like this. I think got us to 256 by 256. Um, and the quality was good, like for that time. It was significantly better than, you know, the uh, images before that, right? Where we were seeing kind of parts of faces being morphed into weird things. So that was quite a significant step um, by adding this constraint. Then we had in 2017, shortly after that, unpaired image translation. And uh, this was just taking two entire collections of images rather than collections of pairs of images. This was, you know, there was un unpaired. There was no idea of like what one image's pair was with the other, um, in the other collection. So for instance, you had a collection of Manet photos of uh, Monet paintings, and you had, you know, scenes of other landscapes, and so on and so on. And this, um, this was a totally different architecture, and it was quite cool. And this comes up every now and then um, in other problems. It's like a domain adaptation problem um, you might find in the literature. Or... There's definitely networks out there that probably aren't in runway or there's some collab or there might be a Jupyter notebook, but it wasn't imported into Google Colab. Like this is why I kind of mentioned some of these techniques. Like there's there's stuff out there just because there's so much out there right now in terms of networks being published. Um, so this, this kind of problem is one that's been solved, say, since 2017. Um, so interesting to think about if there's like a, a much higher resolution version of this or something like that. Probably is out there. I'm just not aware of it. Um, yeah, so they call this one CycleGAN for short. And the previous one was Pix to Pix. You might have come across those names as well. And uh, there's a GitHub for that as well. All right, so in, um, what year was this? I guess this was like 2018, 2019. Um, 2018, let's say 2018. Uh, NVIDIA starts just killing it really, like they have just released this insane data set of 1024 by 1024 resolution images, having scraped Flickr. I don't know how they got away with this. Um, Microsoft tried something similar recently with their celeb data set um, 
like revamp of the Celeb data set and they had to take it down due to copyright infringement. Um, but somehow this one was okay. Don't know. Anyway, so they had created this data set of 70,000 images of 1024 by 1024 faces. And um, they trained a generative adversarial network on it. And the network was uh, really high resolution. Like it was able to be trained on that 1024 by 1024 image collection, unlike previous networks. Um, and it was very, very kind of like consistent in the images that it was producing. Like they looked very lifelike. Um, and uh, so that was a significant advance. And the kind of architectural changes that they made were they learned in what's called like a progressive fashion, um, which is, yeah, like not the political progressive, but I'm talking more like they had um, learned the low resolution image first, and then they learned a slightly higher resolution, and then a slightly higher resolution from that. And that enabled it to slowly learn the highest resolution. Um, so yeah, it was kind of a, it was a trick, you know, it wasn't like something mind blowing in terms of the insight into the math or anything like that, but it, it definitely works and it um, produced some really cool images. So that's StyleGAN1, right? So this is 2018, I think. And then we're at StyleGAN2, basically. What, what happened with StyleGAN2? I didn't include a slide for StyleGAN2. We're going to look at it. Um, but, you know, before the lab, I just want to jump into some artists that have been exploring these techniques. And um, luckily, this website was created just last week that collects a bunch of ML artists. So I didn't have to go and create a bunch of slides for this. But you can literally use this website to search for technologies like StyleGAN. And you can see like who are the artists that use StyleGAN. Um, it's definitely not comprehensive. Like it doesn't list every artist ever for sure. Um, it's probably overfit to certain populations of people. I'll let you take a guess, but um, it is very, you know, larger than anything I've seen out there. And it's quite cool how you can search by artist or technology, um, year, medium, like it's some pretty cool axes here that you can explore. So you can type in um, StyleGAN and see who was exploring StyleGAN or just GAN simply. And you'll get what, like six pages of artists there. That's quite cool. Um, I want to pick out, I think, a couple of artists that I think um, just that I've seen that I, I like their work. And it's, worth just kind of talking about a couple pieces. So uh, let's see, Anna Riddler. A GAN collage of uh, beaming tulips. So the idea here was that she had um, different, this isn't being animated, let's see. So this was a video installation, um, 2018, 2019, 2019 it looks like. And um, she had a data set of tulips, um, surprisingly. And then here we're seeing the generation of the GAN's interpretation of the, that tulip data set. And she's explored a couple iterations on this data set um, and model, I suppose, which was one was a printout version of this here. This was 2018. I like this one quite a lot. It had uh, this handwritten note on each of the images as well. And 
Uh, this was exhibited quite a lot. Um, just the kind of like sheer amounts of it and the kind of relationship to a data set, I think was quite cool. This Anna Riddler, has anyone seen this work? Or any of Anna's work? And then um, Mario Klingerman. Uh, quite a lot of work here. So Mario's uh, been working with GAN since day one and um, has done a lot of, like he is a very, He's very intimate with the code as well. Like he's somebody who will also develop tools um, in code to uh, hack the networks or combine networks together or really kind of architect um, tools to allow him to explore the networks in ways that are beyond what um, the authors of the code um, releases would allow you to do. Um, or even people like um, what what people are doing with runway is really trying to also uh, allow these sort of things to happen, but for everyone. Right? Like Mario has spent a lot of time, I think, on building his own set of tools. Um, I think we'll start to see that some of these ideas that he's explored with his work have start to become more easily accessible through tools like runway. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of inspiration um, there. Is. Uh, so this one could be quite cool to look at. I mean, they're all very interesting. I think they, let's look at this one. This is quite an interesting idea. So you have a model which is trained on data of a um, movie sequence, effectively. And so this was a pix to pix network. Uh, I believe, but you could explore this idea with other types of networks, even a style GAN or style GAN2. Um, the idea is that you have a set of images in your data set that comes from sequences in a movie. And if you look at the latent representation of each frame in your movie, let's say the first frame you try to find the latent representation for that. Let's say the latent representation is uh, 2,000 values. I'm just going to say it's one value for now, just to simplify the process. Um, let's say that it ends up being the number zero, because that's a simple way to interpret it, right? Then the next frame ends up being the latent value one, and the next frame ends up being latent value two, and so on, and so on, and so on. What happens if you only had 100 images in your data set? And so you really only had the latent representation up to 100. Well, you could still feed in the latent value of 101 and see what happens. Um, that's, that's kind of uh, a really simplified version of what um, what he was exploring here. Uh, it's, it's very kind of a natural thing to do with a fix to fix network, um, a bit more involved to try and do it with the stand, style GAN or something else. But that was a cool exercise. Okay. Um, yeah. And then here, he's um, starting to do some neural surgery, um, neural glitch, he calls, um, as a technique to randomly start editing parts of the network. So let's say you had an image and you projected it, um, or you, you had a latent representation and you projected it and you came up with an image and it looked like a normal face, right? what would happen if you just started randomly editing parts of that network? What would the face look like? And um, so he, he came up with a way of doing this, but in a way that still preserved a lot of interesting detail. 
And um, I think if you if you try a naive way of just like editing random parts of the network, you know, weird things will definitely happen. Um, and they will look quite cool. Um, but I, I'm assuming that he refined that process, you know, quite a bit to get these effects. Okay. Let's see. In a similar vein, um, let's see. No, it's not one. Oh, yeah, here we go. Cool. So, this is one of his works. It is. Um, Right, so this was an interesting idea where Terence Broad decided that he didn't want a data set and he trained a network without any data. And it's sort of like a feedback loop that I think that he explored here where you kind of have like a no input mixer, if you're familiar with that term, where you, you have like a sound mixer and you take the output and you put it in the input. So you explored that idea here with the neural network and tried to see what would happen to a neural network that just trained on itself and started to try and find equilibrium points that you could play with, much like a neural input mixer. So um, that was quite a cool idea, definitely a, a sound practice, I think, informed um, process and led to some pretty fun aesthetics. This is, a, this is an hour long video. Yeah, there's a lot. In there. So, it can definitely lead to some interesting mechanics. Um, this has some more recent work, I think. Uh, I guess this was the recent one. Okay, this is 2019. Um, that's also quite an interesting work. Let's see. Uh, then uh, let's look at Sophia's work. Um, so Sophia has been working with different um, kind of nature imagery or like uh, um, I'm trying to think of like is it Henkel, Ernst, and Meyer kind of stuff. Um, very very cool work. I think it's just. Uh, Kind of mixture of the scientific illustration, but also the highly colorful and detailed um, um, images of different plant life, animal life, and, um, things like that. So that that was a really fun. Definitely check out her work if that interests you. Um, and there, there's just loads more, and I think this website has done a pretty good job of finding quite a lot of work in a short time. And I think that they're continuing to add to it. Um, so if you see something that you like that's not on here, I think you can just link it and say, you know, this should be here. Um, but yeah, I think that's more or less what I wanted to talk about. And Rafiq's work, of course, which we've seen in this course already. Um, his work tends to work with GANs and then import that uh, generative uh, imagery into a 3D modeling software like Houdini or C4D, where he can apply lighting and depth extrusion, you know, all this fluid simulation stuff, and really get eerie with the generations of those images. That work is very cool, very cool. And he works with the scale and magnitude of stuff that is very, very hard for somebody who hasn't been working with this stuff um, for the last four years to do. So we are 
now going to look at Runway ML. Um, if you haven't already downloaded it, uh, you can download it. There's also a web version. Um, the web version is fairly new. Um, the whole software is fairly new, really. And it's, it's amazing what they've accomplished in such a short amount of time. Um, I will preface this introduction to Runway with the disclaimer that I have not spent nearly enough time with Runway and that I have really learned um, what I know about Runway by um, a couple of different people's videos. And uh, Dan Schiffman's coding train has a series of introductory videos with Runway, which are very good. Um, Gene Kogan as well through the Runway ML channel um, also has a set of videos. And um, then there's a, another artist educator that has a series of videos um, from his course, uh, Derek uh, Schultz, I wanna say his last name is, I might be messing that up. Uh, but if you check out Runway ML on um, YouTube, you will find a lot of good material. Um, Derek's channel is Artificial Images. And um, his videos are really good. I think they're very, very useful. Um, and he has a playlist of 13 videos on runway and um, just on StyleGAN. And he also has like his students' presentations on there as well. Um, he's also got sets of videos on Colab as well, if you're interested in that stuff. Um, he, he has a lot of really good material. Uh, so check out that. Um, and then Dan Schiffman um, as well, his, his material is always excellent. Um, and he talks about Runway ML as well. Uh, I think the, the Derek's videos, I'm, I hope that's his name. Uh, his videos are much more recent and, um, but not a lot has changed to be honest. So um, Dan's videos from a year ago are still uh, very good. Um, Let's see, let's jump in a little. So I'll share my screen again. Cool. So when you get Runway, you will log in with you know, the account that you've already created and you'll be presented with this uh, home screen. And so you can create models. Um, there's also kind of like quick action sort of things like a sort of Photoshop version of runway where you know you just want to lighten up an image or get rid of a background or something like that um, so there's that kind of section and um, then there's this browse um, area which is a good way to kind of get started just kind of see what models are there and um, you'll see a huge collection of models basically and they're labeled with the the technology um, that was used. Uh, so this is YOLO, this is some object detector. Um, there will be style GANs. Um, there's text generation stuff in here. Uh, all sorts, really, really cool amount of stuff in here. I've only scratched the surface, really, I think of what's possible as runway. Um, but you can look for different style GAN models. Um, people using Runway have trained their own um, style GAN models and made them available to the community. And you can do that as well. So you can, um, we'll look at that in a second. You can train a model with style GAN or style GAN 2, and you can make that model available to anyone. The kind of ethos that at least it initially started with, and I think that the, um, that same ethos still exists, is that you have this sort of node-based programming approach to um, deep learning, uh, or this, this kind of like new wave of weird techniques that are coming out of the AI and CS communities, computer science communities. And typically like what, people like myself were, were doing before Runway was that, you know, some, some uh, new paper had come out like StyleGAN or StyleGAN2 had come out and um, you would hope that they released the code. And like if they didn't release the code, you pretty much didn't even look at the paper. Um, that's not true, but you know, basically 
when there was a new code release for a new generation technique, you know, everybody would rush within the small group of people, let's say, would rush to um, try the models, you know, like try the code, see what works, see what you could hack out of it, like see how much you could break it, try to see what the extents of that model were. And it often involved just trying to figure out like, well, what are the dependencies? Like, how do I compile this code? Like, they didn't list the steps. There was a bug in that function. Like, you know, half the code just didn't work. And suddenly like the things just changed, you know, like um, a lot of industry got involved in this and the code started to get a lot better and they wanted it to be reproducible and they wanted it to be very easy to use. And um, they started using these, um, this way of creating reproducible environments called Docker as a technology and um, Runway under the hood is using this technology of Docker. Um, it basically allows you to define all of the requirements for setting up a computer, like, you know, install this package, install this package, next and run this line of code, and then so on and so on and so on. And you get basically an environment that can run the code of the authors of these different technologies. And so they they basically created a bunch of different Docker environments and um, uh, allow you to run those same Docker environments, um, but you could run that on your computer. So you, you can basically create a virtual computer inside of your computer, which has installed all the software necessary to run one of these models. And then um, they expanded their offerings so that you could actually do that now on the cloud. So you could create a virtual computer in the cloud and be charged for it. Um, but then it would run a lot faster, you know, because it, it could run on the best possible hardware and GPU and whatnot. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. So, that's just a little bit about the underlying technology, probably too much detail. Um, so when, when you click on any of these models, depending on what type of model it is, um, you'll generally see this sort of input output kind of um, split screen. So for a StyleGAN, for instance, what is the input to a generated image as output? It is the latent representation. It is a vector of random numbers, basically. And so if you find StyleGAN2 in the list of models that are out there, you can um, download that model and you'll be presented with this screen, which shows on the top half um, a set of empty squares right now. And then on the bottom, the output. Um, the, the kind of fun thing that I think that Runway has been going for is that everything should be connected to everything. Like if you can connect something to something else, like we're gonna try and build that connection. So if there's an output for StyleGAN2, but another model takes as input images, then we're gonna connect that up. So you can say, I want my StyleGAN2 to be connected to um, this Glow model here. And that Glow model takes as input images. And it does other things, you know, this is a different model. I'm now in this Glow tab here. And this Glow model, instead of generating faces, can apply different attributes to a face. In this case, you know, there's some thing called attractive, they call it, and that will make that face more attractive, apparently. So that is, that's kind of another kind of underlying architectural kind of thing that Runway has built, this kind of node-based programming or everything can be connected with signal flows into other things. And I, I just love that idea. I think that is totally, insane and brilliant and wonderful. It's what leads to really fun ideas and fun experimentation. Um, there's just 
kind of no telling what would happen when you build something like that. You know, there could be a new model that takes as input an image and does something totally unexpected with that image. And um, I, I find that really fun. All right, so let's look at StyleGAN 2 a bit. So just moving my Zoom stuff. We've got um, on the top here, this thing that takes as input um, a vector. Uh, and on the bottom, we've got the output, which is the result of whatever that vector was. So you'll see some options on the right, um, which allow you to change what the model is here in, in this checkpoint area. So this is a faces model. This was the original StyleGAN2 model on that Flickr faces HQ data set. Um, there's some other models provided um, that were trained on different uh, data sets. Uh, this faces uh, model, I think, is the kind of highest resolution one. So this is quite an interesting one to play with. Um, there are some parameters here uh, that change what happened to this latent um, vector here and will lead to different um, behavior as well. Uh, but to get started, you know, unsurprisingly, you'll click this button here, run remotely, and uh, that will basically create this virtual machine that I was talking about in the cloud. It's going to have this environment that is able to run this bit of code. And um, once, it's, once it's going, you'll be charged uh, per minute or um, for, for whatever it is that you're uh, running. So in this case, I'm running on a GPU. So it's going to charge me per minute for a GPU in the cloud. And so once it starts computing, you'll start to see all of these different faces uh, appear in these empty squares. So up here, we are seeing the latent space of this network around a certain point here. So this particular image has a very particular latent code. It has a set of um, 2048 values. I forget this, what the length of the vector is for StyleGAN2, but it will be um, 512 or 2048 values. And this image right here represents that latent representation's generation. And then just next to it, we have another random vector, which is quite close in terms of distance to the other random vector. And so these two parameters are basically controlling this grid here of different random points in that space. Um, you can regenerate the grid. Um, you can save the vector and load a, load a vector. So if you've got a set of different values um, as JSON, you can create your own grid of different um, points. Uh, so let's say I save this vector. I now get some JSON. Uh, let's open that JSON. I've got now some set of values that represent that image. Right, so these are going to be the uh, uh, 512 values, so it turns out. So this, this network uses 512 values. So if I can come up with any random 512 values, I can actually just load that as JSON and then create my own image out of that. So Coming back to the slides a bit, right? So this was the vector right here, the random noise or as a representation of that, you know, that is that latent code, the set of random numbers. Okay. 
Um, there's some really fun stuff you can do other than just save and load vectors. Um, when you go to this export tab on the bottom where the output was, you can start to build up some fun latent uh, walks, they're called, I guess. Um, where did I put this in stuff? Okay. You can basically get a set of random uh, generations and create key points with them down here and then create interpolations between the key points uh, which are just different sets of random numbers. So this, this has a latent code, right? This has a set of 512 values and this has another set of 512 values. And so you can interpolate between those two 512 values by mixing equal parts of them. Uh, <clears throat> and so that's what this, this fun mode does. Um, you can also kind of randomize the network um, generation and then say like, oh, I like this one, or, you know, I want to find all the glass people and then I will create keyframes between um, the starred, uh, the ones that I've saved in my library. So that is another fun thing to do. You can control the video rate, obviously, of these things. Um, and then when you, are kind of ready <clears throat> ready with that, you will have to spend a bit of money to actually create the full video with those parameters. So this is just spending um, to get the keyframes and then it will fill in the frames in between the keyframes by running the model um, and finding the generations between the keyframes. So that will um, cost a bit of money to run as well. In general, these things are quite cheap though, like um, for the amount of complexity that you're able to do very quickly, I would say, like you can experiment quite a lot. Um, I've been using it over the last two weeks and I think I've spent about $20 on this. And um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's pretty fun. Um, and I think I haven't totally confirmed the amount of credits that um, uh, Cristobal has given everyone. So if, if you do get set up with that and you find that you've run over your limit, then um, let me know because we do have this thousand dollars somehow that we could somehow again try to get to Cristobal. So let's see. Um, but I don't expect that we'll run out of funds on this. Okay, so that was a bit of a lightning tour of Runway um, and StyleGAN2 in particular. The last thing I want to show everyone is just training a model. So this is all um, great, you know, like we went to our model collection and we have a model already and um, we can then explore it and connect it to other models depending on what the inputs and outputs are. But um, there's this other crazy thing that you can do with Runway, which is a very new feature, which is you can also train your own networks. And uh, this is growing in support uh, constantly. So I think that they will um, keep adding new things to this. Uh, but you click on this training tab and you will create a new generative image um, experiment. And it's really, really simple to use, I find. Like, I, I really didn't have to um, look up much here. There are some bugs every now and then, but like, you know, nothing too crazy. Um, but the idea is that you will either work with an existing set of images if, if you want to just get started, or you can upload your own data set. Um, with StyleGAN2 in particular, you know, you have a couple options in terms of how much data you provide. Certainly the more data, the more 
um, representative of whatever it is that you've collected is. Um, it really depends on what you want to do, right? Like if you want to be the kind of next face data set, then you're going to need loads of images. Like you're going to need hundreds of thousands of images to surpass what was already done with faces, right? Um, but maybe you also are just uh, adapting an existing face data set. Um, let's take a look at, at that detail in particular. So there are kind of two factors I think that you get to explore in terms of training. You get to explore your data set, which is the biggest one. But the other factor that you get to explore is what is the model that you're going to start with? And so we'll see that. Um, I'm going to use a existing data set, but um, it's quite easy to upload a data set. You just pick images. Um, and then that will appear as a data set. Um, so here, I'm just going to pick the birds data set, because why not? Uh, this will do a lot of work on that data set and it can take you know depending on the size of the data set um, it can take a bit of time to create all the files necessary that stylegan2 needs in order to use that data so stylegan2 won't just um, use your raw png files or whatever they'll have to create like different resolutions of every file and convert it to a particular format. Um, that, that all happens um, with this process right here. So it's really quite interesting um, that they've automated all of this and are making this so friendly and easy to use. Um, so you can apply different behaviors on this, obviously. I'm going to go with this auto crop. Um, and you can do this kind of very painstakingly and uh, apply this to every image. Um, let's see. So I will apply an auto crop to every image. It's a fun data set. Looks like there are 200 types of birds. And wow. okay. Cool. So while this is processing, um, this will be creating different resolutions of the image and storing a particular format of the images. Um, the next step will be to pick a pre-trained model. And so when we're back on that models page and I search for StyleGAN2, you'll see that there are a lot of models available, right? There are a lot of different StyleGAN2 models. Um, what those are, are just trained versions of StyleGAN2. Uh, they already have a set of weights for their generator and their discriminator. And um, they were trained with a particular set of data. Um, so there's one for the Flickr face HQ data set, and that data set um, led to certain weights on that StyleGAN2 architecture. What you can do is you can load up a checkpoint, which is basically just a point in time that represents the training of that data set with that model. So you can load that checkpoint um, that was trained on that other data set and then just continue training it, but now on new data. And they call that um, process like either fine tuning or transfer learning. And uh, it's what Runway allows you to do, which is a really, really um, quite insane thing. Um, so what, what happens is that if you've got a model that was trained on faces, 
and then you go and you train it now on birds, is the image generations are going to go from having generated faces to incrementally, you know, as the model trains, these models train over iterations and they get optimized and it takes time. Uh, but each step of that model's learning will start to look more and more like the data that you gave it. Um, so that that's a quite fun process, right? Like you get to now have this other, other really creative input, which is um, what is the model been trained on already? You know, was it was it trained on faces? Was it trained on birds? Was it trained on abstract images? Was it trained on um, blank pieces of paper? Or was it trained on like you know very abstract looking textures and what you want to then look at is how the model morphs into this other data set with a second round of training. Um, so that, that is a really fun kind of creative uh, way of playing with these models. Okay, so this might take some time. My computer is like very, very hot right now and I might just show you what this looks like on um, on Jean's video let's see right so here we go the first video on their channel is um, model training in runway ml and right so you will see once you get past the data set uh, phase, you will see sorry. So you will see All right, so here you he's got a data set now here. So after this finishes, you would see us this screen here. I've just stopped that data process. Um, so my experiment is still there. Uh, I can jump back into it. And now I've got, you know, what my data set, however much of it was pre processed already, not the full one but good enough and um, we see that screen that we were just just discussing the uh, different um, presets or the different pre-trained models effectively so these these are four different pre-trained models there's one for faces one for objects one for scenes and illustrations um, you can also click the advanced tab and use the older style again um, if you'd like. Uh, here in this advanced tab, if you change the pre-trained model from faces, you can actually um, look for other pre-trained models as well. Um, if you've trained a model as well, then that will appear here as well. Um, so that's a quite fun way to start to explore some really different um, aesthetics. The Training of a model from scratch is actually really, really cumbersome. Um, you can't do that with Runway. Um, it's probably not even practical to do with Runway. Uh, it requires it requires like twenty four gigabyte RAM of uh, video memory, and it's it would be super expensive to run the cloud. Like you would you would just spend a lot to train a model from scratch and it would take like two weeks and um, you'd be, you know, $2,000 um, out of pocket after having done that. So generally not fun to do, um, but that is possible. Luckily, all of these pre-trained models um, still allow you to train models, but, you, you, you know, it's already learned quite a lot and it can pick up from there and although it has some really weird mechanics in between, it will converge 
to some point um, on your data. And it will look, you know, even with as little as 500 images, it will start to look like that data set in some weird ways. Um, so yeah, that would be the selection of this um, experiment with it. Uh, I definitely recommend starting with the faces one. Uh, let's see. And then there's this last option for the training steps. Uh, how long do you want to train this model for? <clears throat> and it will give you some rough estimate of how long that's going to take to train as well. Java. All right. um, so let's say this is a, a two hours about uh, with 3,000 steps. 3,000 steps is about on average enough time to get somewhere sensible. It really depends on what you're after. Um, maybe you only want to train it for one step or five or 10 or 100 and start to see um, what happens if you start doing your own weird random walk of different data sets. Like, you know, be creative with it. You can, you can start to explore different processes. Um, uh, certainly try the, the kind of fixed general process first, but then, you know, know that you can um, certainly think outside the box on these things and try to break the rules. Um, but yeah, so let's try training this for two steps. Um, one step. Nope. The smallest you can do is two steps and it's going to take 20 minutes. Let's see. So this will uh, pre-process the data and load the model. It's also going to do a bunch of other stuff, but you know, you'll start to see different metrics on the progress of your training. Uh, this FID score is um, a, a metric of of the image quality effectively. It stands for the, I think like something inception um, distance, I want to say. It's, it's basically using that image classifier network that we've, that we've used, the inception network. And it's trying to measure the distance um, between different generations of uh, latent codes, um, what that image classifier thinks of that generated image. And if it, um, yeah, it's, it's very weird detail. I don't think I can explain it very well. Um, but it's basically an interesting measure of how much that image starts to look like um, actual images. And the lower the number, the, um, the more like your data it looks like. Let's see. Okay, um, it's still going. I think most of the setup time is really in the beginning. Uh, once this is done, it will appear in your list of models and uh, you can select it just like you can select one of these models. And um, then you can, in the case of a style GAN, explore it just like we've seen before with a um, random vector or in this export tab by building up uh, keyframes and generating a latent walk. So that is runway in a nutshell that covers StyleGAN 2 with runway at least and um, there's certainly way more to explore here. And especially if you start gluing things together or digging deep into the kind of um, the parameters of each model and how you can kind of work outside those bounds as much as possible. Um, or, you know, really kind of work on the creative control of what your data set is and 
um, explore the potential for StyleGAN to, um, to explore your data set in, in interesting ways. I think you can do quite a lot uh, without credits on your own computer. So you, can, you can't train models at all. Um, you can't run models remotely at all, but you can um, run existing models on your computer uh, for free. That's my understanding. And um, that might be a good way to just get started and look at some StyleGAN2 models and try. It's very, very, very slow to run on your computer if you don't have a GPU, an NVIDIA GPU in particular. Um, but that is a potential option to get started. So the homework is very, very open-ended this week, and it is very unsurprisingly uh, produce an image generation with Runway ML. Um, I'm not setting any constraints on this. I really just want you to start to integrate this um, this tool into your practice, however that looks like. It could be a short latent walk with StyleGAN2 on a data set that you've trained. Um, it could be using other people's pre-trained models of StyleGAN2 and exploring the potential for um, exporting random generative images from that model. And maybe it's like one second out of a video that you've created that really doesn't even center the idea of image generation. Uh, the, the homework doesn't have to be entirely about image generation is what I'm trying to get at. Like I, I want you to really just explore how this tool could be uh, integrated into work that you're already doing or had ideas to do or um, wanted to do, you know. Yeah, but if you wanted to get a sense of what people have done with GANs, with different data sets, you know, this is a fairly interesting exploration of that. Like, you could imagine maybe what the data set looked like for, well, this was a next frame prediction model, but that, that one is quite um, fun and eerie. It's harder to do that with these networks. Um, it's it's really suited for a a pix to pix network, and I don't believe that's. Um, let's see, actually, if you can do pix to pix here. Okay, so you can do pix to pix as well with runway. So you would have to train your own though. Let's see. No, so you can't train a pix to pix network with. Uh, runway, unfortunately. Um, but you can work with pre-trained ones. Um, not as interesting, probably, but you know, up to you. The there are picks to picks um, notebooks out there which you can open in Colab. Um, they probably aren't as friendly to use and have bugs and things like that. So. Uh, that's just kind of something that you would have to explore in your own time. 